Hello, hello, yogis. Welcome to Sunday Sutras, your weekly dose of yogic wisdom. My name is Kelsey Delane. I am your yoga mentor. I'm a Reiki master, and I serve and teach yogis and yoga teachers throughout the county and through this virtual platform how to infuse the practical wisdom of yoga into your daily life and into your teaching. So welcome. Thanks so much for being here. Today, we are doing part two of our discussion on beliefs and how they lead to behavior. So the practice of yoga is way beyond asana. Hey, Andrea, welcome. This is a practice of creating transformation from the inside out. So it requires rigorous honesty and it requires that we show up to do the work. So this right here, you watching this video, this is part of showing up and doing the work. So I applaud that. In today's discussion, first, I want to recap a little bit from last week. So if you didn't have a chance to watch the full video, you can be on the same page with what we're talking about today. Last week, we talked about how our behaviors are a result of the thoughts that we think, which are stories that we tell ourselves about our feelings. And underneath all of that, we have systems of belief, our beliefs about the world. So our behaviors are a manifestation of our thoughts, our feelings, and our beliefs. So if we are on a mission to change a behavior and we want it to be a sustainable change, then we need to be ready to take an honest look at the content of our mind and what is present in our feelings and what beliefs may be present under that. Because beliefs are really, really powerful. They're so powerful that they convince us that they're real, they're true. The biggest feedback that I get when I have conversations about this topic with you all here on Sunday Sutras or with my private clients or my students I notice that people are so convinced that their belief is real that they can't even recognize it's a belief. They're like, well, you know, I am a lazy person. That's just true, right? And so the my invitation for you tonight is to be open to reevaluating your beliefs or even acknowledging that they're beliefs, whether you think that they're true with your whole heart or not, it is a belief system. So let's get right to it. Last week, we defined the word vasana, Sanskrit word vasana is the word for a deeply held belief or an imprint on your psyche. So we unpacked that our behaviors are samskaras, our habits, the things that we do often and are good at, those samskaras, those habits, are birthed from our vasanas, like how we see the world, what we believe. And in order to get to the vasanas, because those vasanas are subconscious, we need to look at the behavior, be willing to change the behavior, and give ourselves the time and the space to reflect and come to understand the emotions that are present. Because our mind is so good at tricking us into believing that we are our thoughts. So it can be really, really difficult to disentangle reality from our thoughts about reality or who we are from our thoughts about who we are because our minds convince us that our thoughts are us. We think that those thoughts that are in our mind that play on repeat, it sounds like our voice. And so we think it's us, but the truth is that voice is not you. That voice is your mind and you are Purusha. So if we can come back to that fundamental misperception, the Confusion of two like things is called samyoga. So the samyoga, the confusion of two similar things, when we confuse who we are 
for our mind or our thoughts, the content of our mind, then we're experiencing some yoga. We're confusing two similar things. And when we recognize that and we have that aha moment, like, oh, I'm not my thoughts. So I, the conscious awareness that is me, Purusha, the radiant light that is me, I can take a look at my thoughts and then I can evaluate them. I can investigate where they might come from, what beliefs might be under them. And then I can do some deeper work of getting to the feelings. So I want to talk about some of the comments and questions that I got from last week from you so that I can address them to the whole group. And that way we can all benefit from each other. Sound good? All right. So one question was, how do I sit with the feelings when they cause so much pain? How can I sit with the feelings when they cause so much pain? This is such a common conundrum. And my invitation, my encouragement is that number one, you're stronger than you think you are. So let that sink in for a second. And the other reminder, I mentioned this last week, the feelings, they're already there. So avoiding them doesn't make them go away. Sitting with them, inviting them in, taking a good long look at them actually helps them to heal and to move through you. So I like to envision my mind as a blue sky and feelings or thoughts, whatever it is that I'm meditating on. If I envision myself as a blue sky and then the feelings themselves are like white clouds that float in and out of my experience without attachment to them. So when I notice that I'm also, just like I'm not my thoughts, I'm also not my feelings and feelings aren't facts. So feelings aren't facts and I'm not my feelings, they don't define me, then I can watch them come and go. And when, only when I actually acknowledge that they're present and I let them come into my consciousness, I let them be present, I embrace them, I experience them, only then do they pass through. So one big distinguishing language piece that I want to point out is the way that we speak about our feelings. I often hear and say <laughs> that, um, I hear students say, when they're telling me how they feel, they say, I'm sad, right? I am sad, or I am angry. The truth is you aren't those feelings. Those feelings aren't who you are. So a more accurate phrasing would be, I feel, hey Leah, I feel sad. I feel angry. And that helps. Language is huge in how we experience the world and we undercut it all the time. So when we frame language that is, is more honest and more uplifting, that I feel sadness, then we can recognize that the sadness is not us. And we can recognize that the sadness is a visitor, like the, the poem, I think it was an, an Oshu poem that we read today in a meeting with Uplifting Yoga about how our feelings are guests. So if you are the hostess with the mostess, I couldn't resist. <laughs> if you are the hostess and your feelings and thoughts, but we're talking about feelings right now are just guests, they're just visitors, and you host them while they are there, and then you let them leave, then that's when the work of processing and digesting is done, and that's when the feeling can teach you what it's there to teach you. So when I hear the question, how can I sit with the feelings when they're causing me so much pain, when they cause me so much pain, the truth is you're already in pain. The feelings aren't causing you pain. It's the story you're telling yourself about the feelings. That's what's causing you pain. So for instance, if you identify that you have the feeling 
uh, sadness present. Okay. So sadness is present. The sadness itself is just a feeling and that's not what's overwhelming you. What's overwhelming you is that you believe number one, that the sadness is too much for you to bear. And then you resist it. And number two, you have thoughts about this sadness, perhaps wanting it to go away, wishing it wasn't there, telling yourself you shouldn't feel it, replaying the story about what it is that is um, bringing sadness into your life, replaying that. So when you acknowledge that you are not the feeling and the feeling is just a visitor and that you are strong enough, you are resilient enough and courageous enough to welcome the feeling, you'll realize it's not the feeling that's causing you pain anyway. So we'll get to more of unpacking what the feeling is. Hey, Isa, a little later on, but I wanted to start with that. Recognize you are not the feeling. So change the language from I am fill in the blank to I feel fill in the blank. And already that's going to create a shift. The other thing is that um, when you name something, it loses its power. So as soon as you name what it is that you're feeling, you identify it, you will immediately receive a little bit of relief. So when you acknowledge the feeling, you name it, you label it, that creates a calming response in your body. So give that a try as well. The second dilemma I had a student share with me from last week was, I can't find an emotion for my desire to fill in the blank, right? So in this case, it was this desire to indulge in a food of choice. And what she was trying to do was figure out what is the feeling that's underneath me wanting to indulge. And she couldn't seem to find the feeling that was connected because at the moment she felt fine. Okay, so the feeling that is present, being able to understand the feeling that is present, it's not always gonna directly correspond to the moment you're having right then. So if you're, if you're working on having discipline with food, and you're feeling an impulse to indulge and you check in with what emotions are present and you're like, I feel calm. I feel fine. I don't know why it is that I would be wanting to eat right now. My encouragement is instead of trying to create an association with what you're feeling and the desire to indulge, simply observe what is present for you without any judgment. Just give yourself time and space and stillness to check in with the thoughts that are present and the emotions that are present. A lot of times when I ask my students what feelings are present, they'll say things like, well, I feel like I want Starbucks. It's like, okay, that's not a feeling. <laughs> that's a desire. So it's also a thought. What is the feeling that is present? And the feeling that is present might be contentedness and that's okay. It doesn't mean that there is something wrong or you're specifically searching for a negative feeling that's driving this behavior that you're trying to change. You're just giving yourself consistent opportunity to take inventory of what is going on. So I hope that helps with that. Also, um, in, you know, in conversations with students when they're trying to figure out what is causing driving this behavior, right? Because last week we talked about beliefs leading to behavior. And so the question of if, if I escape to the shower or I escape to social media on my phone or I escape to food, is there anything wrong with that? Like, is there anything wrong with just wanting to escape and indulge? Yoga is not about right or wrong. It's not a morality thing. It is about bringing more joy to you. So I would turn the question back and say, what is it that you're trying to escape? If you're escaping to the shower, if you're escaping to social media, or you're escaping to food, odds are there is a feeling present and that's what you're escaping. 
And that's where your work lies. Underlying all of these questions and comments is misperception. So avidya, avidya is misperception. It's not seeing things clearly. And that's what causes us suffering. Because according to the Yoga Sutras, your natural state is a state of confidence, wisdom, and joy. So if you're not in a state of confidence, wisdom, and joy, then there is some kind of klesha. A klesha is a cloud in the mind. There is, some, there is something present that is blocking you from connecting to your most authentic self. And that's what the whole practice of yoga is about, is removing obstacles. Yoga is not about adding something into your life. Yoga is about removing the waste, unveiling the light. And so when we get all of that junk out of the way, then what we're left with is, is Purusha, is this bright shining light of radiance and joy and confidence and love. And that's how we know that our behaviors are uplifting us. That's how we know that our thought patterns are uplifting us. That's, no, that's how we know that we're dealing with our emotions and we're letting them pass through and embracing them and digesting them. That's how we know that our beliefs uplift us. So that's your barometer. That's your gauge. Am I in a state of confidence, wisdom, and joy? If I'm not in a state of confidence, wisdom, and joy, then there is something about reality that is distorting my perception. So there's a vidya present. There is some kind of misperception. And so it might be that you're identifying too closely with your mind. And if you think it, you believe it's true. That's misperception. Our thoughts lie to us all the time. <laughs> and our feelings aren't facts. So just because you feel something doesn't make it so. And the beauty of that is knowing, giving yourself that reminder that your feelings aren't fact, it means that you are free to feel it. And it doesn't have to mean anything. It just, all it means is that there's an emotion present. That's it. And then we start to unpack these emotions for what they really are, which are sensations in the body right? That man, that result then in some thoughts in the mind that then play on into our behavior. So when, when we unpack what these feelings really are, they lose their overwhelm. They lose their intimidation factor. They become non-threatening. And when feelings are non-threatening, then they flow through you so much faster because you're like, oh, hey, anger, I recognize you. I wonder what you're trying to tell me. And then your feelings become informative. They become your teachers. They become welcome guests because you understand that they're there for a reason. And then you can address that reason and you can go on feeling joy, confidence, and wisdom as connected to Purusha. I want to clarify too. I am not saying that life is all rainbows and sunshine and butterflies. That is the opposite of what I'm saying. Just because who you are in your nature is Purusha and Purusha is confident, wise, and joyful, that doesn't mean that feeling anger, sadness, or any of the other emotions that are less present, pleasant, that is not saying that you're doing something wrong or that um, that's not part of being human. However, we don't need to suffer because we have those feelings. You can simultaneously be experiencing anger and confidence, wisdom, and joy. That sounds crazy, I'm sure, but that is one of the promises of a yoga practice. The yoga sutras say, sutra 248 says that when you master these things, you will no longer be disturbed by duality. So you can hold two opposing ideas or two opposing feelings or two opposing concepts of reality at the same time and not be disturbed by that. So I am in no way suggesting that we act like we never feel unpleasant emotions because that is not real or true and it doesn't help us 
be our most authentic selves. It doesn't help us connect to Purusha. It doesn't help us do the healing and the digesting of our emotions. So just want to make that clear. All right. So one, one of the beliefs that I see super common as a thread through our culture and even in the dialogue that I've had with my students since last week's uh, Sunday Sutras is that our feelings are scary. That's a feeling um, or that's a belief that I've noticed is that feelings are to be feared. And I want to walk us through a tangible practice to see if we can demystify that a little bit and recognize feelings for what they really are. So if you're on board, we're going to do a little practical activity together. And I want to start by saying that in order to become skilled at, at this practice that we're talking about, this practice of being mindful of what's going on in your head, being aware of the feelings that are present, being able to distinguish between who you are and your mind. That is an art and a skill and something that is to be practiced. I believe that it is a mandatory part, mandatory piece of the puzzle that you have a daily stillness experience. So this is not to say that we all need like a 30 minute meditation practice or that we all have tons of time on our hands. I understand you're busy. I'm super busy. I get it. However, when I, for the last like 10 years, I have been committed to a regular stillness practice, a daily stillness practice, and I have come to believe that it is a necessity. Stillness, solitude, quiet, time to decompress and reflect is no longer a luxury in my mind. And if you read the Yoga Sutras, it becomes really clear that these skills won't just come to you by osmosis. They must be practiced. We aren't just inherently good at recognizing our thoughts and feelings and then doing the emotional healing ourselves. Like this isn't something we learn in school. It's probably something we didn't even learn from our parents. And so it's up to us now that we've been giving, given these tools and we have an outlet to share them and communicate them and ask questions about them and process them, that we do the work of getting down to business of the internal experience. So if you show up every Sunday and you watch these videos, that's amazing. And I'm, I hope that you've already started to see how, that, how this information, this wisdom can start to settle into your core and create some change. But the reality is if you're not practicing on a daily basis, this skill, this process of getting to know yourself, then you probably are experiencing change slowly. So these stillness practices can be super minimal. If you like to go on walks with your dog and you turn off your technology, you're not scrolling Instagram, you are outside experiencing the moment and you give yourself just some time to decompress. To me, that counts as this stillness practice I'm talking about. If you do have a practice of sitting in an upright, an upright position and closing your eyes and having a formal meditation practice, that's awesome. If you're a journaler, you get out paper and you let your day out in ink on paper, that's fantastic. Whatever medium or activity of stillness, practice of stillness, works for you, own that. And it doesn't have to be long. It can be two minutes a day. It can be 20 minutes a day. But the bottom line is that giving yourself time to become familiar with the, your inner um, terrain is an absolute necessity for this practice of yoga. And I'm going to talk to the mamas right now real fast. Girlfriend, I get it. You have other people that are relying on you to take care of their needs. And that is a big responsibility. Also, I promise you, you'll be a better mom. 
if you schedule time that's just for you. I don't know when we decided that moms no longer have the luxury of any kind of quiet time to themselves because life is so busy, but I think that that is making our society ill because moms are totally depleted and they are out of touch with their bodies and their hearts and their minds because they're so overwhelmed with the day-to-day -day tasks. And I really wholeheartedly believe that this stillness practice is not a luxury. It is, it is a fundamental basic need, at least for me. So maybe you just have it all figured out, but I don't. I need daily time that's just for Kelsey. And if I don't get it, then my basic needs aren't met. And there's no way that I can show up with my whole heart for my family or my students or myself or my friends. So that is my invitation is that you make this a, a regular practice. Thank you so much, Leah. I know you are a mom of four. This, this woman is a busy girl and she's saying, amen. People don't believe me when I tell them this. And I 100% agree, but we are about the change. So together, we are going to empower each other and ourselves to commit that we are worthy of our own time and attention. And our kids deserve a mom who's well taken care of and who is best to take care of us but ourselves. So let's get into this practice together. In clarifying, when I'm talking about feelings, I'm talking about emotions, I want us to keep in mind five core emotions. If you want to do yourself a favor, after you watch this video, you can look up a feelings wheel or an emotions wheel, and you can get a whole wheel that will depict how these five emotions branch out into subtler emotions. But these are the five emotions that we're going to capture and talk about today. The first is sadness. Then we have happiness, anger, surprise, and fear. So those are the five core emotions that we're going to that we're gonna use as our foundation when we're doing this exercise. And in this exercise, I, I know for sure with me that the only way that this exercise is impactful is if I approach it from a place of curiosity, openness, and acceptance. This acronym, COLE, curiosity, openness, acceptance equals love is from Dan Siegel. And I really, really love this acronym. And I've just recently incorporated it into my life thanks to Uplift Team Yoga. And when we approach our feelings, our emotional territory with those three things, curiosity, openness, and acceptance, we can have love for ourselves in the process. So let's start with that tone. And I'll have you close your eyes. So hopefully you're in a place where you're not driving and you can do this. If not, you can always rewind later on on the replay and you can do this practice where you have some time to sit in some stillness. So as you're comfortable, yogis, feel free to sit up tall. If you want to lay down and close your eyes, by all means, make yourself comfortable. And when you're comfortable, let your attention migrate to your breath and allow your breath to become a bit more intentional perhaps slower more expansive more rich and as you allow your attention to migrate here to your breath notice how your breath moves throughout your body notice how your belly expands when you breathe in and softens when you exhale. So allow this shape change, this movement through your torso, your abdomen, your chest. Notice yourself sink a bit more deeply into your physical body. I will repeat a few statements and internally, just in your mind, I want you to finish these statements. I'll pause in between for you just to sit. 
When I wake up in the morning, I feel. When I sit down to eat and meal, I feel. When I'm at home, I feel. When I leave the house to go to work, I feel. When I go to bed at night, I feel. Allow yourself whatever time you need. And if you chose to close your eyes, feel free to open them. Likely, you had a range, perhaps, of emotions that are more pleasant and emotions that are less pleasant. And I want to answer the question of now what? Okay, so let's say that one of the emotions that you feel throughout a given day is anxiety. What does anxiety actually feel like? The next time you feel this emotion, or if you want to repeat that practice, that we just did, the exercise that we just did, investigate what anxiety actually is. What is anxiety? Does it have a place that it shows up in your body? For me, anxiety kind of bounces between like my heart and my solar plexus. And it's very, very fast moving. Anxiety feels like fast moving and it, it feels like my heart beating and it feels like I can't, like my body is crawling. That's what anxiety feels like to me. So when I'm able to identify what anxiety feels like in my body, then when anxiety is present, when it's a visitor, I can say, oh, that's what I'm experiencing. I'm experiencing anxiety right now. I can feel my heart beating. I can feel my temperature rising. I can feel that I am uncomfortable in my skin and being still is really difficult. And then once I allow myself to feel that feeling, then I sit with it. And then what? And then guess what? You're still alive. You sat with the feeling and it didn't destroy you. It didn't defeat you. You are still okay. That's how simple this practice is. It's, it's a, 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 a big picture practice because at first it's very intentional. You can sit down, you can get out a journal and you can, you can free write and kind of pull an emotion. Okay. I'm feeling sadness. What am I feeling sadness about? Maybe is something that you want to ask yourself, but also where do I feel sadness? What does sadness even feel like? And then when you give yourself permission to own it in your body, to own fear, to own anger and recognize it for what it is as sensations in your body, all you need to do with that information is let it be felt. Anxiety is present. I feel anxiety right now. And that is so much more manageable than I'm anxious and I, this must stop. <laughs> Our willingness to receive emotions as they come, it stops us from fighting against the emotions and in, in ceasing to battle against them, we recognize them for what they really are. Oh, interesting. I have this feeling and it feels like this and that's present for me right now. And you know what I know about feelings is they don't last forever because I just 
listed a bunch of different times throughout the day and had you feel some different feelings or pull up some different feelings. And I guarantee it wasn't the same feeling all throughout the day. So that means that you are, you are moving through multiple feelings in any one given day. So you can, in, you can embrace the feeling knowing that it's not going to defeat you. It's not going to destroy you and that you're still okay. And that itself is the practice because you familiarize yourself with these feelings and you become more and more resilient, more and more confident that you can be with these feelings and they aren't anything to be afraid of. So I hope that this provides a little bit of clarity of why we're doing this practice of becoming aware of our feelings, how that has anything to do with our yoga practice, what to do with this information moving forward. And if you don't already have a stillness practice, my invitation is for you to start with two minutes of journaling in solitude every day. So if you don't have an idea of how to start a stillness practice, this practice of reflection and refinement and getting in touch with what's present, schedule two minutes a day. It can be the beginning, the middle, the end of the, of the day. It doesn't matter. Sit with yourself in solitude and relative quiet. Journal for two minutes, and there you go. It's, you got to start somewhere, yogis. It's not going to be magic overnight. That's not what this practice is about. It's not about quick fixes. It's not about feeling good all the time. It's about having the courage to show up and to do the work. And sometimes the work is just these little baby steps that we take. And in the big scheme of things or in the long run, we look back and we go, you know what? Like for me personally, I've been doing this for 10 years. I was having a conversation with my cousin about where I'm at right now. And obviously she's known me my whole life. Um, I used to be so debilitated by anxiety and so, um, worn down from depression and sadness. And now when I feel anxiety, I no longer am afraid of it. I just recognize that it's there and that's okay because it's going to be gone. <laughs> so I'll live. And so will you, Yogi. Thanks so much for joining me. Please share questions, comments, feedback below. And if this benefited you and you have a friend that would also enjoy it, share this video, give it a like so people can see it, and let me know what you guys want to talk about next week. Much love, yogis. I'll see you soon.